We are in uh, Proverbs chapter 19 this morning, beginning in uh, verse 13 through 17. You know the movie Zero Dark Thirty about the, the killing of Osama bin Laden. And you remember the, the analyst, the lady, after she discovered his whereabouts, the compound, the house, and everybody was so reluctant to do anything. So she would come up to a glass window and she would write a day on there and circle it and keep reminding him of how long it's been since she had discovered this compound and the government had done nothing. So if I had a glass board here, I would circle it and write a number that I'm missing my drums and my piano. <laughs> I'm not grumbling. I'm not complaining. Just saying. Here we are. Proverbs 19.13. Now, in the first uh, two Proverbs, particularly are domestic, and I really treated the third, even though it wasn't the, it's a slack person and not a son, as domestic, I have uh, given the applications all, uh, in light of the family context, and you'll see that. But here's what I want you to do in approaching these, uh, these three Proverbs, particularly the first three. You think of them in the context of the Jewish culture, the Jewish society. That's going to be the uh, NBC peacock for you. It's going to bring, it, bring the color out. It's going to lift the proverb off the page. I think you'll see things clearly, if you will think of it in terms of that culture and that society. Here is 13, a foolish son is destruction for his father, and the wife's quarreling are a leaky roof that drips constantly. 14, a household and wealth are an inheritance from father's but from the Lord is a prudent wife. Fifteen, laziness casts into deep sleep and a slack person hungers. Sixteen, the one who keeps a commandment is one who preserves his life, but the one who despises his way will die. Now, that is moving from the domestic into just observations, wisdom. So that's the difference between 13, 14, 15, and 16 and 17. Here's our final one, 19, 17. The one who shows grace to the poor is the one who lends to the Lord, and for his deeds he will repay him. Now, here's the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs. This morning, here is 13. The greatest sadness for the man. That's 13. The greatest sadness for the man. 14. The greatest gift for the man. The greatest gift for the man. 15. The greatest wickedness for the man. The greatest wickedness for the man. And 16. Now these are the practical uh, observations of life out of the domestic realm here. Daily decisions for life and death. That's the way I'm going to teach it. Daily decisions for life or death. And 17, the wise life 
of giving away. The wise life of giving away will show an abundance of blessing. Will show an abundance of blessing. The wise life of giving away will show an abundance of blessing. Okay, here are our Proverbs. The first three in the context domestically of the home, the foolish son, and the wife that is always quarreling. Important relationships for the home, for the man. Specific to address to the man, here is the father, the home. It's a son who makes foolish life decisions. And secondly, the ultimate relationship, the annoyance of a wife is likened to the torture of a dripping, watery roof. Now, line one, the foolish son is destruction. That is the word used in Job chapter 6 and verse 2. The great calamity of Job. What would we say about that great calamity? We would say he was wiped out. He was wiped away. That's the word destruction here. Like a tornado hit him. And specific to the son here, the father is left without a son to sustain him in his old age. See, we're looking for the competent son in this child training book of Proverbs. And the son would be competent enough to preserve the family. Because remember, what you were given in that culture is from the Lord. It was your land. It was your farm. It was the allotment that was given to you to sustain the family from the Lord. Now let's think about this for a moment. Let's consider the destructive behavior of the sons of Jacob, for example. What a wicked lot they were. Now, let's kill our brother. No, let's sell him. Get something for him. And then they, they take that coat. And can't you just see it in your mind's eye? The, the way they ripped that coat in two. Well, they, they, they wanted to rip him that way. They ripped that coat and they dipped it in some blood. And they took that back to their father. Now, look at that scene. Think about that. How wicked these boys were to see their father rent his clothes and suffer. That's the kind of men these were. Wicked to the core. But look what happened. Think about the proverb. Wisdom prevailed. Eventually, because Joseph inherited the double blessing from the father and preserved the family and the family line. He was the great son among them all. And he provided for them and for their future. You see, he was the competent son at that point in time. Genesis 48, 26, your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains and the bounty of the age-old hills. Let these all rest upon the head of Joseph and on the brow of the prince among his brothers. Now here's line two, the second relationship of the man in the house, the wife's quarreling. Or your translation may have Conflict. These are likened to a leaky roof, which occurs in Proverbs 27, 15 as well. The King James reads, A continual dripping on a rainy day and a contentious wife are alike. Man's specific place of refuge where he can go and find peace and comfort is really turned against him in the home. 
the last place he would expect an attack in the home and from his own partner, specifically here, the assault of a nagging woman who never lets up. That's the picture that you have. Now, we've already covered Proverbs 14.1, a foolish woman with her hands tears down her house. But I want to remind you godly ladies, you women who seek wisdom, the skill for living, what you have in your arsenal from the Word of God, it's 1 Peter 3.1. Here it is. You are to be subjection, subjective to your husband. Live in subjunction to him. And put on that gentle and quiet spirit. And you see what you're doing when you make that change for yourself. You make that decision for yourself. Then the, the crosshairs of your husband's heart comes in full focus to the Lord. And now the Lord will direct His observation and His power to Him. And that's where you want to be. Now you're in the rocking chair. And His problem is with the Lord and not with you. You see, a gentle and quiet spirit with a stubborn husband, now, you leave that to the Lord and watch what He does. It starts with you. Howard Hendricks in his book, Conflict, Crisis, and Confrontation, said, I used to go back to my office angry and frustrated. Oh God, change my students. Angry, conflicted at home. Oh God, change my wife. Change my children. But then came the day, he said, that I threw myself across my desk in my office and said, oh God, change me. And when I did, then things begin to happen. You see, revival starts in the heart of the righteous. And that's your proverb. Here's the contrast from the previous proverb. Here is good things, most, pro most notably from a father's good name and reputation from the previous generation. But as great as that would be, it can't possibly compare to the noble wife, the wise wife. Here's your proverb. We've studied it already. 1822, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. We're talking about good things here. The inheritance from fathers. And 1822 says favor. We know that word. It's showered down from heaven upon us. We can't make favor happen. God makes it happen. That's the Word. The household is a daily function of her management. And she is a wise wife. A prudent wife. Not like the one Samson, who in disobedience picked, married a Philistine from Timnah, who in disobedience wrecked havoc on his life. Not like Esau in disobedience who married a Hivite and two Hittites. And finally a fourth, Basemath, the daughter of Ishmael, an Egyptian. And these actions weren't the will of God. Not for these men, but they led to moral evil and corruption in their home. That's what happened teaching us that the wise can and must. Now listen to this. For your sons and for your grandchildren, they must wait upon the Lord 
to provide. The Lord God, just like in the garden, He will bring the woman to the man in providence. It'll happen. So our proverb declares, look, from the Lord. No doubt about it. You see, the best inheritance that one can be given, that's Proverbs 17.6, the glory of sons is their fathers. That's the way it should be in the perceptive will of God. But you look at the world. The world thinks just the opposite. What did you get? What did He leave you? Howard Hughes was left a fortune. A lot of good that did him. What a vile life. You see, if you have a godly parent, you really have something. You have something very special. And here's the way it's described. In a reputation of pure gold. I don't know about you, but my gate swings wide open for godly men and women that I know for their children. It's part of the ability to have that relationship and build that relationship in them. How important those parents are to that young person. And they need to see it. And they need to see it's like a master charge card. It opens doors for you. I know your father. I know your mother. I know where you came from. That's it. That's the idea. Look at line two. The wife who is the co-heir is the inheritance. She's prudent. What is that? Wise behavior. Good sense. The ability to grasp the implications of a situation. That was Abigail before David. Her actions saved the life of her worthless husband, Nabal. Her competence, she grasped problems involved in running the household and finds solutions for them. She throws all of her energies into the successful management of her household. Now, in the ancient Near East, a wife was selected by parents. That's Abraham, Genesis chapter 24, calling his servant, making a specific request regarding a wife for his son Isaac, and by oath, a sworn oath. We pray for our children. And we pray for the choices that they make. And we trust the sovereignty of God and His divine providence over their lives. That daily guidance. That's pictured for us in righteous Ruth, the Moabitess. And in providence, she is led to the field of Boaz. And under the watchful eyes that range to and fro throughout the earth, God's sovereign blessing came together for both she and Boaz. And that became our inheritance. Ours. Yours and mine. Because except for that marriage, we have no line that takes us to Jesus Christ. How important these relationships are. You see, it is Boaz that is the father of Jesse. And Jesse is the father of David. And we have to have David in order to have the line in the kingship. David from Judah takes us to Christ. So humanly speaking, all of these intricacies are so important for us. The wise wife, the prudent wife, she declares it, she is from the Lord, is what the proverb declares. So teach your children, teach your grandchildren to focus on the Lord daily. You have got your saddle full 
You focus on the Lord. Don't worry about anything else. God will certainly bring her future certainty in the path. The proverb says, from the Lord, the gift to the man that completes the man. That's what the wise wife does, the wife of skill. She doesn't remake him. She completes him. And that's the proverb. Here's 15. Laziness casts into deep sleep and a slack person hungers. Foolish strategy for living, and particularly for a son in a home, leads to its own self-destruction. The foolish son will destroy the family's inheritance. We just saw that from verse 13. Now here, we get a detailed explanation of it. Look at this top line, sleep. The word means deep sleep. It comes from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 21, where the Lord put the man into a deep sleep. That's your word. And took out one of his ribs and made a helpmate for him. Our first word, top line, laziness, the opposite of the diligent ant that we studied in Proverbs 6. It shows a moral degeneracy here. This boy is a sluggard of Proverbs 24.30, and lacks sense. Lacks sense, that's just the opposite of the prudent wife who looks at a matter, applies her mind, and puts wisdom to it. This boy can't think his way out of a bag. He lacks sense. And so, He is asleep. Closed off to all reality. Doesn't know what's happening. A disgraceful son. Proverbs 10.5 He sleeps during the harvest. He doesn't know. How can he know? He's asleep. What all happens when you sleep? You don't know. I was asleep. Now you see that and... Right there. That's so important. Why? Why? Because that combines the physical consequences with the spiritual cause here. Look, a slack, meaning negligent or idle. And now look at the consequences. He hungers because he is progressively deteriorating. His lack of activity is against the will of God for his life. He's lazy. And therefore, he deprives himself. But even more, a worse thing, a more horrible thing, is he deprives the family. He deprives the parents. He deprives his own children. I've seen it. It's disgusting. Here's 16. The one who keeps a commandment is one who preserves his life. But the one who despises his way will die. Now we're into observations of wisdom itself. The wise child will follow the advice, the counsel of his parents. And in doing so, he will enjoy the abundant life that God provides. And death is the contrast to that. It's the result of the fool who doesn't follow the parent's counsel and advice. Look at this, the one who keeps, meaning to protect. It's the word that the Lord God used with the man in the garden. He was to keep the garden. He was to protect it. That's the idea of the Word. And commandment here isn't the law. No, this would be the specific directives given by the parents to the son in the home. The oral teaching of the parents, it preserves. Now, the word preserve, your English translation, 
He probably uses the word keep twice. But they're actually two different words. The first word is to protect, keep, like the garden. And here's the second word. Keeps first, preserves second. What is preserved? Well, interestingly enough, it comes from the root of our familiar word, way. The way. We've been listening to the way all the way through the book of Proverbs. What is way? Well, way are daily decisions. They're your reference point from day to day of life, wisdom, skill. You see, the, what the proverb is saying is the moral decisions, the way that one takes, that he makes daily, it's clearly reflected. And they preserve the wise. They preserve you through life. And we know that's to be a fact because of the first psalm. A wise psalm. Psalm 1, verse 6. Here's the King James. For the Lord knows the way. There it is. There's your decisions. Your daily walk. He knows the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked will perish. And that's exactly what the second line of our proverb is saying. Look, the one who despises. Now we're into the theme of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And fools, and here's your word. Same word, despise. Wisdom and discipline. So what are we really talking about here? What is this proverb really saying to us? It's talking about an attitude. It's talking about a daily demeanor. That's what it's saying. You see, the fool pays no attention to the consequences of his foolish behavior. No. He didn't think of consequences at all. But that's what the book of Proverbs is constantly reinforcing. Consequences. Consequences. This is a book of consequences. And here are those consequences. Look at them. Death. Will die. Future certainty. Categorized for us in two ways in the Old Testament. Let's think that through. Genesis 2.17. Here it is. For the day you eat therein, you shall surely die. Two deaths. The first, the severance of spiritual life. Man no longer has fellowship with God. That happened that day. That very day. No more walks in the evening, in the cool of the evening, in the garden. No, man now is an enemy. He's sinful. He's wicked. And a righteous and holy God cannot have fellowship with that. So from now on, fellowship to be restored will cost a life. It will be blood spilt. God alone spill that blood. And He was the first to spill it. Genesis 3.21 The Lord God made garments of skin for the man and his wife and clothed them. That's the first death. That's the death that occurred that day, that hour, that moment in the garden. Here's the second death. Clinical death. That's the way your behavior and my behavior takes us to the funeral home. The cessation of physical life here. 
Here's what the Bible says. It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. The fool's folly will bring both of those consequences together to bear upon that man rather quickly. That's the fool's way. We're all fools. You either have had the blood spilt and you are clothed in the righteousness that He gives to you that He gave in the garden, or you are vulnerable, unprotected, and your way will come to an end rather quickly. When I was first became a Christian, I knew nothing about the Bible. But I was active in Christian organizations on my campus. And they would often have me get up and give my testimony. And uh, I really could give a good testimony because I really had a radical change to my life. And I was very aggressive in my evangelism, and particularly with people that I knew. There was one young man, a couple of years younger than me. He was rather arrogant, obnoxious. And I can remember I got him alone in a room, my room, at night. And I talked to him. I waved my hands at him. For an hour or so, oh, he rolled his eyes. He couldn't wait to get out of there. I wanted him to stay forever. And I basically just gave him my testimony, how Christ had changed my life. Well, he left. He was anxious to get out of there. And I saw him one more time right before we left for summer. And I reminded him again of our conversation. You can imagine my shock when I got back to campus in the fall to hear that he had been killed. And I sought out a friend of his. Boy was from Salisaw, Oklahoma. And I sought out his friend. I was utterly shocked, frozen. Tell me what happened, I asked. And here's what he said that I will never forget. He said, Mike, he was hit by a fast-moving car. And he said, you know what? His shoes were left on the highway. I've never forgotten that. That visual picture. His shoes left on the highway. He's gone. Taken away. In a moment, in an instant, his shoes still there. When are we going to take to heart the Word of God? Meditate on it. Memorize it. Carry it with us. Here it is. It's Ezekiel 18.20. Had your meditations there lately? Here it is. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And that's the proverb. Here's 17, our final one for the day. You know, the Greeks, the philosophers, they said that their gods were only concerned with great matters. They had no interest in small things. They're called trifles. But look at our proverb. Our God takes a great interest in trifles. You see, that's the poor. They are the riffraff of life. We just, you know, get them out of our way. But our God takes a lot of interest in the trifles. The numbers of hairs on your head. 
the sparrow that falls to the earth, the plight of the orphan and the widow and her mites. Let's give the woman, the woman all the credit we can give her. It's mites. Weak things, tiny things, small things. That's the idea. Now look at the proverb. The wise quality of generosity is highlighted. It was highlighted for us in verse 6. Now here we have it highlighted for us again. The proverb uses the idea of a loan. Isn't that interesting? A loan. To commend generous behavior toward the poor. And God Himself will reward those who do such behavior. The wise make the poor really... They make the poor a prize. That's the best word I can describe for it. I got that idea by thinking about David picking Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. From low Debar. What a name. Like Grandfield, Oklahoma. A gas station and a grain elevator. Low Debar. That's where he was. And well, what's the picture of David with him? It's not, it's not door number one. It's door number one, two, three, four, five. Here's Mephibosheth. He can't walk. He's crippled, but he has got an entourage carrying all these packages for him. That's David with Mephibosheth. And you see, that's what the proverb is saying. Look at this. The one who shows grace, here dealing with those who cannot in any way pay back the gracious loan. Here's the promise for you. It's Psalm 37, verse 26. Why did I pick that? First, it's a wisdom psalm. Second, it uses the same word gracious. The same word of our proverb. The beneficiary of your behavior will in fact be your home. Your own home. Through the lives of your beloved children. The righteous, David says, are ever lending graciously, generously, and their children will be the beneficiaries in abundance. Blessed. We have the same idea in another wisdom psalm. Psalm 112. The man who fears the Lord will benefit with mighty children, that's verse 1, in the land. One of the characteristics of this life from Psalm 112, verse 5, uses our same word. Proverbs 19, 17. Grace. It is well with a man who deals graciously, generously, and he will receive abundance and blessings. They flow into the household, into the children of your life. You see, we're thinking about lines here in ancient Israel. I tell these young men all the time that come into my Friday morning Bible study at 6.30. Oh, they're all revved up, ready to go. And I tell them, you want to have money? You want to have assets? Okay, here's the answer. Give it away. Give it away. Why do I say that? Because I think I'm being clever? No. Here's why I say it. Because His promises are more certain than the next breath you take. That's what I believe. Don't be wise in your own eyes. In all your ways, trust the Lord. He's going to bring it to pass. That's what the Proverbs say. And look, His deeds... Those little trifles. That is the lending 
in your top line. Literally showing kindness, showing generosity. It's the deeds of the Good Samaritan. They were made self-evident. That's Luke 10. Bound his wounds. That's performed triage, pouring oil and wine on his lacerations. Took him to the inn. Now that Samaritan's a busy man. So he goes out and pays somebody to look after the man. Nurse him. The innkeeper. What is that? Trifles. Deeds. Small deeds. You know what the proverb is saying? The just Creator of all the earth takes it upon Himself to pay back in full. That uh, story of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, that is about the neighbor. We know the neighbor. We've talked about him often in Proverbs. He's the third party, remember? The man on the street, remember? We don't know him. We just know of him. Who is my neighbor was the question to the parable. The story that Jesus told. Haddon Robinson, the teacher of the big idea, had a big idea for this sermon. And he preached it right here in the 70s at Believer's Chapel. Here's the big idea from his sermon on that text. Who is my neighbor? My neighbor is anyone I see in need whose need I'm in a position to meet. And to do that, to do that, my friends, your God is your receivable. Think about that. Your God is the one who owns cattle on a thousand hills. Don't dismiss that thought. Let's think about that. Think about those cattle. He raised those cattle. Did the Lord God take that original stock to the county fair and get a blue ribbon? How did He get those cattle? He got them like He did everything else. He spoke those cattle into existence. Just like He spoke the heavens into existence. He spoke them into existence. That's how powerful He is. My friends, when's the last time you went fishing with the Lord Jesus? That's Luke chapter 5. Maybe you need to climb in that boat again. You remember the story? He tells Peter, now let down your nets. And what happened? The nets begin to break because the abundance of fish was so great. And now the boat's beginning to sink. And other boats come up alongside. And they load up. And now they're beginning to sink. He creates quite a calamity with what He can produce. He speaks. That's the one you're loaning to by being kind and by being generous. My, my question is, why am I not more generous? Do I really think that He can't chin my debt this is the Lord. You can't outgive Him. He is no man's debtor. Do you believe that? Isidore Miller was a Jewish man from back east. And he was a drilling partner of my original partner in my business. And he would come in and, boy, the two of them were, you talk about two odd fellows in the same room. And Isidore Miller, this Jewish man, he had all of these sayings. And they were very wise. He would say, you've got to lay it down to pick it up. You've got to lay it down to pick it up. You pay to drill. And then you can pick it up. Very simple concept. I think we all get that. Okay. So now, who among us 
is willing to lay it down at the apostles' feet starting today like you never have before. Because once you do, my friends, He becomes the big debtor to you. And what an enviable position that is for the believer. Buy the truth. Don't sell it. Put it on your lips. Memorize it. Carry it with you. The decisions that you make will shape your life forever and ever and ever. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time of study in the Word this morning. We're so grateful uh, to be together and have this fellowship. We're so grateful for the Word of God, for Mark and Cindy, and for Cindy's successful surgery. We're so grateful uh, for them and for their commitment here to this place, for the elders, the deacons, for the gifted men who put in time and effort to teach us the Word of God. How grateful we are for the abundant blessings that you provide. In Jesus' name, amen.